times. Here in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, uh, the Apostle <coughs> Paul is getting a little bit personal about some people that had made his ministry difficult. But in the course of that, he also is teaching us a lesson that there's going to be Christians who will backslide. And that's sad, but true. And a warning, if you will, to beware of these things that can lead us astray. So beginning in verse 18 of 1 Timothy 1, the Bible says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So this morning our title is Shipwreck. Pray. Lord, use your word in our lives this morning to teach and grow us, to convict us, to comfort, whatever the need might be, we pray. The Holy Spirit would take the powerful word of God and apply it to our lives, Lord, that we would be listening and learning and allowing you to do the work. We would leave changed. We trust this, Lord. We trust the power of your word. And so we pray that Christ Jesus will be magnified in our service. And it's in his name that we pray these things. Amen. So Paul here is, refers to Timothy as his son. He's about to give him a, a charge. Remember, he wrote this book to help Timothy, who had become a pastor, uh, to guide him in, in being a, a good pastor. Uh, he looks like he, he was one of the first pastors. He was one of uh, what they call Paul's preacher boys, which uh, is, a, is a man that he would, he would raise up and train to be a pastor and then install him in one of the churches that he planted. And so he's writing Timothy, one of his converts, one of his, uh, his one of these men that he had mentored, and giving him a bit of a warning as a Christian and as a pastor to say, be careful, because sometimes there are Christians who fold. Uh, the devil's crafty, and he, he, he makes this happen. But he says in verse 18, that thou mightest buy them war a good warfare. He reminds him, and he's done it in other, other epistles as well, and over in 2 Timothy also, that we are in a war. And when you look at what he's talking about here, really there's three areas that lead to shipwreck, and this is the first. And that is when God's people stop fighting. And they stop fighting the war. In 1 Timothy 6, 12, Paul told Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. We're here to fight. If somebody told you, well, once you become a Christian, it's just you're going to cruise your way to heaven. It's not how it works. The day you became a Christian, you entered into a battlefield with the devil, with the world, and with your own flesh. And that battle doesn't end until we get to heaven where we, as we're told in Hebrews, will have a time of rest from the battle. But for now, we're in a battle. Over in 2 Timothy, God refers to us as, as soldiers. And... Um, these people who had fallen into shipwreck, the first thing that we see is they, they stopped fighting. And we can't stop fighting, and, and we are in a war. If you go to 1 Peter 2.11, I want to show you we're in a war against a lot of different areas and a lot of different battlefields. And if we didn't have God's help, if we didn't have the Holy Spirit living in us, there is no way that we would have a hope of being able to fight this war. But because we have God on our side, amen? God before us who can be against us, we can. We can fight. But we have to fight. That's the point. Notice uh, 1 Peter 2, 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. And so we are firstly in a war against what? Our own flesh. And as, as you're saved longer, you learn that that's actually our, typically our number one enemy is our own self. But we are in a war against the flesh. Paul said, I run not as uncertainly so fight I, but as one that, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body, and I bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others on myself 
should be a castaway. He says, I bring my body into subjection. We are in a war against our flesh. But beyond that, if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, this is another front in, in the battlefield of the war that we're fighting, and that is in our own minds. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, the Bible says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Look at the next verse. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We're not only in a war against the flesh, we're in a war in our own minds. And this is where, where the devil tends to fight us the most, is in our thought life. And we all know this to be true. We've been saved longer than five minutes. That our thoughts give us a lot of trouble. And we have to fight. We have to fight. It, it, it never ends. And that's what this is saying. We have to cast down the imaginations. We have to bring every thought of the obedience of Christ. This is a conscious effort. But we have to fight these wrong thoughts with Scripture, with God's help. And then if you go to 2 Timothy again, uh, chapter 2 this time, verse 4. So we're not only in a war against the flesh and the mind, but we're in a war against this world as well. Which is a third front of this battle. Notice 2 Timothy 2, 4. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please whom I have chosen him to be a soldier. But notice God has chosen us to be a soldier, but he says that as we're fighting the war, we can't entangle ourselves with the affairs of this life. We can't get wrapped up, so wrapped up in the world and the world's things that we can't fight. And so, this is serious business this fight that we're in. Because we are in a war against the flesh, against the mind, and against the world. And of course, who, who is orchestrating all this against us? Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He is the God of this world. And he uses the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, to constantly attack us. And we have to keep fighting. If we choose to stop fighting, it's just going to lead to shipwreck. As we read. So let's go back to our passage. Firstly, this morning, what leads to shipwreck is when we stop fighting. When we stop fighting. But secondly, notice verse 19, holding faith. Holding faith. Not only is when we stop fighting lead to shipwreck, but also when we stop trusting. We stop believing. Stop trusting the Lord. Stop holding faith. If you go to 2 Timothy 4, just over a couple chapters, verse 7. The Apostle Paul said, I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. It's amazing how often Paul uses fighting and war as ways to describe the Christian life. And even, by the way, 2 Timothy chapter 4 is the last chapter Paul wrote before he died. And he says, I fought a good fight. It's a fight. But he said, I've kept the faith. Christians who have been shipwrecked, they've stopped trusting God. You know, the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Right? Lean not unto thine own understanding in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. But Christians who have, who have backslidden, who have fallen shipwrecked, they've stopped trusting God. They're trusting themselves or trusting their own resources, their job, whatever. But they're not trusting God. And they've stopped living their lives by faith. Which, by the way, we're commanded to do. Are we not? The just shall walk by faith. So shipwrecked Christians have not only stopped fighting, but they've stopped trusting and believing the Lord. Uh, if you go to 2 Timothy 2, just over one book, notice verse 16. God says, Shun pervain and vain babbits, for they will increase unto more and ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth the canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and 
Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. So the faith is not only talking about our trusting the Lord, but trusting the truth of his word. <coughs> have you ever known a Christian to be led astray doctrinally? Of course we have. Tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, we're told in Ephesians 4.14. What happened? They stopped trusting the Lord. They stopped trusting God's word. They stopped being in God's word. They, and this is what the devil does. Oh, it's not that important that you study God's word today. Oh, you don't need to go to church this week. And what happens? Slowly but surely, they stop trusting and believing the Lord and his word. And what results is shipwreck. So we see here that those who have been shipwrecked, they not only stop fighting, they stop believing. But notice verse 19 of our passage, 1 Timothy 1. He says, and a good conscience. A good conscience. I, I worded this that they stop caring about right and wrong. Because that's what our conscience does, right? God uses our conscience. He gave us our conscience. And he uses it to convict us <coughs> about wrong. That's why it's there. When we were growing up, we, we learned our, uh, about these things. A lot of it was just innate that God gave us as children. We, we knew we did wrong. God, God, we had that, that guilt, if you will. Where did that come from as a child? It, it, we just knew that was wrong. Now, yeah, our parents taught us right and wrong and and hopefully we went to Sunday school and we learned it. But, but there was something inside that we knew when we did something wrong. That's called our conscience. That's one of the things that sets us apart from the other animals of this world. They don't have a conscience. But we do. And the Bible tells us that our conscience even is there to tell us that God exists in Romans chapter 1. <coughs> but those who've gone shipwrecked, they've stopped listening to their conscience. They stop caring when the conscience says that was wrong. <coughs> and the Bible teaches that our conscience can be seared. And what does that mean? Go to second, or 1 Timothy 4. If you're already in 1 Timothy. Look at chapter 4, verse 2. Here he's talking about the end time. <coughs> and he says, 1 Timothy 4, 2, Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And if we continue to ignore our conscience, which the Holy Spirit uses to convict us of sin, we will slowly sear it to where we can't hear it. And shipwreck Christians, that's exactly what they did. Look uh, two books over to Titus 1. <coughs> Titus chapter 1, verse 15. <coughs> the Bible says, Under the pure all things are pure, but unto them... That are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Paul talks a lot about the conscience. And then one more, 2 Peter chapter 2, if you would, verse 20. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. And so what we're finding is that these Christians who have gone shipwreck, another name for backslider, <coughs> It wasn't something that happens instantaneously. And, and as you have been saved a while and you've known Christians that have backslidden, you know, even the times when you've backslidden, it, you don't just go from you're serving God today and tomorrow you're backslidden and away from God. It's a process. It, it happens little by little. That's how the devil works. It's just one little thing at a time. And, and one thing you always see is Christians who are backslidden, they've stopped studying the word they've stopped having a quality prayer life and they typically have stopped going to church you just it's just the way it works why go to church and feel convicted every Sunday when you know you're not living for God why have to go and put yourself under that and, and listen to the Holy Spirit convict you and tell you you're, you need to get things sorted just stay away why open the word and have the Holy Spirit use the word to convict you why go get on your knees and try to pray and have the Holy Spirit say, you got some things to sort out. So they just back away. 
Notice 2 Peter 2.20. For after they've escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they've known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. By the way, God made dogs and pigs, didn't he? And if you've ever had a dog, you know what this is talking about. It's what dogs do, isn't it? They throw up and then they eat it. And we're all like, oh, there's no way I could do that. But God says that's what we look like. When we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, born again Christians, go back into sin. And we all know that it's a waste of time to take a pig and clean it all up. If there's a mud pit nearby. Because he's going to be as clean as can be and run and dive right back into that mud pit. Because that's what he does. But we're not pigs and we're not dogs. We're God's children. But God says this is what we look like. When we allow our conscience to be seared, when we stop listening to the Holy Spirit, when we stop believing how important it is that we continue to do right and stay away from sin, and it all leads to shipwreck, when we stop fighting the war that we're in, when we stop trusting the Lord every step of the way, and when we stop caring about right and wrong. The result, verse 19 of our passage, 1 Timothy 1, which some having put away, Having put away what? Having put away this war as being important. Having put away their faith. Having put away their conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. And we've all known shipwrecked Christians, and maybe we've been one at one point. And Paul says in verse 20, of whom as Hymenius and Alexander, he's even listing names here. Why? Because these two men actually started attacking him and his ministry. And he said, whom I've delivered unto Satan. It's not what you want. But sometimes Paul had to do that. The man in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that was having a relationship with his mother-in-law and the whole church and the whole community knew about it. He said, deliver him unto Satan. For the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. In other words, he's a born-again Christian, but he's living like the devil, giving to the devil, and let God kill him. So he can no longer ruin his testimony for Jesus Christ. You say, well, that's pretty extreme. Yeah, sin is extreme. And God is holy. And he hates it. And if you wonder how much, look at Calvary. That's how much God hates sin, and that's how much God loves man. That they may learn not to blaspheme. When we allow ourselves to be shipwrecked as Christians, and we stop fighting the war that we're in against the flesh and the, and the mind and the world, and we stop caring about trusting the Lord each step of the way, and we stop caring about right and wrong, essentially we are blaspheming the Lord. Because what we're saying is, God either doesn't have the power to change my life, or it's not important to me. And both of those essentially are blaspheming the Lord. That's what he's saying. These guys have gone shipwrecked, and they are blaspheming through their behavior. And there's many other times in Scripture where Paul says the same thing. He talks about servants. He talks about husbands and wives and how our behavior can literally blaspheme the Lord. Now, I'm sure nobody in this room has ever heard somebody out in the world refer to a Christian as a hypocrite. We all have, haven't we? Why is that? Because the world knows better than some Christians that Christians are supposed to be different. Amen? Because they claim to have the Holy Spirit. Because they claim to be born again and on their way to heaven. Because they claim to be children of God, followers of Jesus Christ. That's what the word Christian means. And yet a lot of times their behavior is the exact opposite. And hence we get to hear this word hypocrite all the time. Well, we don't have a place to be hypocrites. 
And we don't have a place to stop fighting, stop trusting, and stop caring about right and wrong. Or we will end up on this heap of shipwrecked Christians with the rest of them. And then God has to deal with us the hard way. So what's the solution? Just don't let it happen. Keep fighting. Every day it's a fight. Keep trusting the Lord every day. And every day, listen to the Holy Spirit. Intentionally expose ourselves to the Word every opportunity we can. Be in church. Open the Word every morning. Get on our knees every morning. We've got to keep going. Is it hard work? Absolutely. Does our flesh want to do it? No. And by the way, that's not going to change. It doesn't matter if you've been saved 30 years. Your flesh still is going to fight you when you try to pray. And when you try to read God's word. And the devil's still going to try to come up with excuses to not do right. He's not going to stop. Got to keep fighting. The last thing we want is to be a shipwrecked Christian. Let's pray. Lord, I want, to, I want to thank you for this example from Paul's ministry, Lord, of these men that had fallen into shipwreck, Lord. And we have all known Christians that have done the same. And may we not be one of them. And may we love the ones that we know that have, Lord. You told us to restore them in the spirit of meekness. Help us to pray for them and love them, reach out to them. Care about them, Lord, that they might be drawn back to you in righteousness and fighting the war again, trusting you. So, Lord, I pray that this would truly have an impact in our lives as we look at our own lives and light of Scripture and the Holy Spirit. And I pray that, Lord, as we sing an invitation hymn together, that we'd be honest about where we stand, Lord, and maybe we've begun to slide in some of these areas and we would get that sorted before it's too late. Thank you. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.